Hi there, everyone. Mr. Lewis here with your very first video lecture recording uh, for the 2020-2021 school year in AP Human Geography. So first of all, welcome to the course. Uh, like I said, my name is Mr. Lewis. I'm not going to be doing all of these video lectures. Uh, Mr. Arcella and Mr. Hoffman both teach this course as well. Uh, Mr. Hoffman has four sections. Mr. Arcella has three sections. I have four sections myself. So um, there are a lot of kids taking this class, but uh, you should applaud yourselves for, for taking on the challenge uh, as a freshman to get into an AP course. That's, that's great. Um, we really congratulate you on, on doing the work to get to this point. You know, there were obviously some teachers in, in middle school that really believed in you and, and thought that you had what it took to be in this course. So we're happy to have you. Um, know, first of all, that, and you'll see this in these video lectures, we're one team. So regardless of which teacher you have, you're going to get all the same material. Uh, you're going to have the same opportunities. You're going to get the same tests. There's really not a huge difference other than just who we are personally. And uh, I think we're all pretty great. So, uh, you know, I'm a little biased, but Mr. Arcella um, is a, a football coach at the school. Mr. Hoffman is a baseball coach at the school. Um, I'm involved with, with other clubs and activities. You will see us all around. And we want students who are in our classes to feel comfortable going to those other teachers that teach AP Human Geography because we're one team, we're one group. We set group goals as teachers, the three of us. And we try to achieve those goals as a group. So for example, when the AP exam comes around in May, uh, we want you to feel comfortable going to any review session, regardless of which teacher is actually hosting that session, as well as through the entire school year. If a, if a teacher is out sick, we want you to feel comfortable going to another teacher that teaches AP Human Geography. If you have a question, if you have a concern, we're one team, we're one unit, we want to achieve our goals together. So. We will have these video lectures posted throughout the school year. So th this isn't just for students who are doing remote learning. Uh, this is also for students who actually are there for the lectures in class, but maybe have other things on their mind and, and are distracted by something and want to go back and, and listen to those lectures again later on. Uh, we'll always have the notes posted. So the Google slides that we use in class will always be there for you. We're just going to go ahead and give you these video lectures too to make sure that if you are gone, uh, if you're doing remote learning, you're not getting anything less than what your peers who are in class would be getting. That doesn't really seem fair to us. So we want to make sure that you have access to the same lectures um, in our own words. And even though there will be different instructors putting these videos up throughout the school year, it really helps you as a learner uh, to, to hear different people explain things in different terms and in different ways. Um, so that's going to be really beneficial for you too. And it will contribute to, like I said, that team environment that we want to uh, really instill throughout the school year. So with that said, today we're starting with Intro to Human Geography. And it, and it is some basic foundational stuff, but it is really, really important. So um, we're going to get into some, some really cool topics, maybe more fun topics throughout the, the year, uh, especially you know in, in Unit 2, we get right into it. But Unit 1 is about laying that foundation. We've got to make sure you have the basic skills when it comes to understanding maps, for example, before we can get into the more difficult things. And these things do come up on the AP exam. A lot of students made the mistake of thinking that they didn't need to go back and, and look at Unit 1 again because that stuff wouldn't be on the exam. But it, it is on the exam. I think it's 10%, uh, if I'm not mistaken, of the actual AP exam. So it is important. And uh, it's going to lay the, the groundwork for everything else that we do. So today, for this specific lecture, this is just section 1.1, um, meaning unit 1, section 1. And today we're going to talk about maps and different types of maps and what maps can do for us. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Let's jump into it. Introduction to Human Geography. Section 1.1 is Introduction to Maps. And maps are a crucial tool for any geographer. And today we want to be able to answer this question, what can maps tell us? So, do you see anything wrong with this map? And I know you can't answer this question, but think to yourself, is there anything weird about this? And I can see a few mistakes, but I've also taught this class before, and I've seen this map before. But just start sort of scanning over the map from left to right. Does everything look normal? We know Alaska is pretty big. There it is. We know Canada is pretty large. It's got a lot of islands. It's what we call an archipelago, a uh, nation made up of many, many islands. 
the United States, there it is. Look up here. Greenland looks awfully big, doesn't it? Now, if you watch this, uh, this video on the next slide on your own, uh, I'm not going to watch it right now, but it's from a, a TV show called The West Wing, and, and they put up some projections of maps for these workers in the White House, these uh, office staff, and, and they're really surprised at what they're seeing because, in fact, Greenland is not almost the same size as the entire continent of Africa. Okay, that is incorrect. Um, however, Alaska is pretty large. When you look at Alaska laid out on the United States, it is pretty big. I mean, we're talking about maybe a fifth of the, of the country there. But on this map, it looks to be maybe a little bit more than that, like half the country. So sometimes maps are lying to us. Another point, there's not even Antarctica on this map. They're missing an entire continent. So maps aren't always perfect, right? Um, just like uh, uh, sometimes teachers screw up in the things we tell you, or parents might screw up in the things they tell you, um, but don't tell them I said that. Sometimes maps are screwed up a little bit too, because they're created by people, and human error occurs always, right? Uh, we always see human error occurring around the world in, in any field. So there was this uh, uh, father of geography, Eratosthenes, and he is considered the father of geography because he was the first one to actually use the word geography. He put together earth and to write or study geography, geography. So it's a study of where things are located, excuse me, on the earth's surface and why. Why are people more uh, concentrated in this area of the world versus that area of the world, that sort of thing. So we're really boiling it down to two questions in this course. One, where are people and activities actually found on Earth, and why? Okay, why are there so many people in a place like New York City, or a place like Mumbai, India, versus maybe somewhere in Wyoming, right? Wyoming is beautiful. Why isn't it highly concentrated with people? We're going to talk about those sorts of things throughout the year. Now, thinking about how maps can help us with these questions, maps give us the ability to think spatially. Spatially means um, in space, right? L looking around, uh, uh, not just a, a single area that we can see with our own eyes, but reference points and places across oceans and distances and things like that. Uh, relative sizes, that sort of stuff. So maps help us to do that. A map is a two-dimensional, so we're not talking about a globe here, a map is a, a two-dimensional or flat scale model of Earth's surface. So something you'd be, have to be able to put on a page, or at least a portion of Earth's surface. So it doesn't have to be the entire thing. Geographers display and analyze info on these maps. So they serve really two purposes for us, and I kind of hinted at this. One is a reference tool, right? Just locating, identifying places, um, you know, just closing your eyes and pointing to somewhere on a map. You know you're going to get some location. So locating and identifying places is one tool, um, is one uh, uh, type of reference tool that a map can, can help us with. We also have a, com a communication aspect. Maps serve the purpose of communicating information to us, and we're going to see how they actually do that because, of course, maps uh, make no sound, right? They're just on a page or on a screen. So how can they actually depict information? So now we're getting into the depth of a lot of people look at maps, but in human geography, we look beyond that and we look a little closer at some of the specific information that those maps are actually giving us and how it helps us answer questions such as these. Where are people and activities found on Earth and why are they found there? So cartography is the science of map making. Uh, if you're interested in, in making maps when you get older, it's very much a profession. Uh, you can go to school to actually get into cartography and, and uh, I had a student a few years ago that did that actually. So this is something that goes back thousands of years. Some of the earliest known maps were from the uh, 6,000 BCEs. Um, so there was this town in Turkey, and you can see the map here. This is one of the oldest maps that, that we have in existence. And uh, it is pretty, pretty clearly depicting a town, right? And then here's a three-dimensional rendering of what that town might have looked like.
So the problem with maps is that if you're taking a round surface, um, because yes, the, the Earth is, is round, um, spoiler alert, but if you're taking a round object and you're trying to put it on a flat surface, you're gonna get some issues. Um, a projection is the scientific method of transferring locations on Earth's surface to a flat map. So basically a projection is the space between taking the Earth as a globe, as a sphere, and putting it onto a flat surface. If you think about taking a baseball and unwinding a baseball and, and getting all the threads out of there and, and uh, uh, taking that um, outer covering, it'd be hard to just put that flat into a rectangle, right? That'd be pretty difficult. So instead, we have different projections that are used to, to make up for that. The major issue is what we call distortion. Maps are distorted because if the Earth is 3D, then the shape, size, and distance of objects can change as we go to a flat uh, map. So there are four types of distortions. One is shape, two is distance, three is relative size, and four is direction. The shape of an area can be distorted. The distance may become increased or decreased. Relative size may be altered uh, between two countries, as we saw. And then the direction from one place to another can be distorted as well. So you might think you're going southeast, but really you should be going more south, that kind of thing. Here's the Winkle projection. So you can see what they've done here. They've tried to actually keep sort of that, that sphere look. And on top, it's flat. On bottom, it's flat. But then our meridians, these long lines stretching from the north to the south pole, start to bow out either way, right? And then our parallels do the same thing. So that's the Winkle projection. Here's the Mercator projection. You can see some of the issues already. Look at Greenland compared to Africa. Greenland is just not the same size as the entire continent of Africa. That doesn't make any sense. So there's some issues with the Mercator projection, but you can see it's a, it's a much tighter, neater, organized grid of parallels and meridians, right? The, the uh, lines that we have there. The Gall-Peters projection is um, kind of, uh, people describe this as looking like it's, it's stretching it out. That word might have come to mind for you. But uh, uh, it actually doesn't look terrible when you look at the relative size of things, say Greenland versus Africa now or the United States uh, against Africa, or, or the United States versus, say, Europe, or, or things like that. Um, and then we have the good Hamazlin uh, projection, which is kind of like the baseball I mentioned, right? If you actually took the Earth and unwrapped its skin, so to speak, and laid it out, this is kind of what you would get, because it wouldn't be a perfect rectangle. You would have some gaps there, and that's what this one is trying to show you. Now, in each of these maps, we have these grids, right? These different geographic grids. And they're just imaginary lines. They don't actually exist. But we needed a way to grid maps. And so we came up with this idea of meridians and parallels. When I say we, I mean geographers a long time ago. Came up with this idea of meridians and parallels. Meridians go from the North Pole to the South Pole. And they help us measure longitude. Parallels circle around the globe Okay, kind of like the equator, that is a parallel. And those are lines of latitude. So in each of these projections, regardless of the type, we have meridians, the lines moving north and south from the North Pole to the South Pole. They help us measure how left or right something is because to move to a new meridian, we're going right or left, right? To this line, this line, this line. And then parallels are these lines that go all the way across. And here's the equator in red. From there, we're moving north or south. So lines of longitude go from the top to the bottom. Lines of latitude move left to right. Okay, so those are there in the uh, notes if you ever forget. The prime meridian is sort of like the equator of meridians. It's considered zero degrees longitude, and everything is measured from there, right? So if you move east, you're in the eastern hemisphere. If you move west, you're in the western hemisphere. Uh, the equator is commonly known as just where it's super duper hot, 
And that is true, but it is also zero degrees latitude. And, and we measure north and south from there because that's kind of the starting point right in the middle of the Earth, separating the northern and southern hemispheres. The United States is in the northern hemisphere. And there are those lines of latitude and longitude, and, and it kind of gives you an idea of, so this would be the prime meridian, and then we move east and west, and those lines start to bow out a little bit more, right? And then the same thing happens over here with latitude. So this is getting into your final section of 1.1, uh, which is the different types of maps. Now, we're going to be using a lot of maps throughout the year, it's going to vary between these five different types of maps when we're looking at all kinds of different information. So if we're talking about language, if we're talking about religion, if we're talking about uh, agriculture, we might use different types of maps to suit our needs a little better, right? So let's go through each of these five types and then you're going to have an activity that actually helps you better understand and work with each of these different types of maps. An isoline map basically connects places with similar data points by just outlining them. A choropleth map shades different states or countries or counties with high or low value. So a different shade of red might represent a higher or lower value. Graduated symbol maps just simply put, the bigger the value, the bigger the symbol. It doesn't matter what the symbol is, it's about how big that symbol is. Dot distribution is like uh, kind of like the art where people use dots to make larger pictures. Well, if something is less in an area, it wouldn't have many dots. But if there are more, those dots are going to fill up so much that they become a big blob, essentially. A cartogram map actually changes the size of an area to represent a specific uh, statistic. So... Um, it might take a small country and make it look really big because it has a big population and that's what the map is telling us. So let's look at these different types. Here, we're using an isoline map to represent major corn growing areas and minor corn growing areas. So in the dark green, it's outlined for major corn growing and what you'll notice is that here's Crown Point right at the bottom of Lake Michigan there. And uh, we are in a major corn growing area, in case you didn't know that. We rock at growing corn, really, really good at it. And then that area goes all the way around Indiana, Illinois, okay, over into Iowa and into Nebraska, uh, even so South Dakota a little bit, and southern parts of Wisconsin and Minnesota. And then you've got the lighter green area. So you can see that corn grows in other parts of the, the country, even down here in uh, South Carolina, Georgia. Um, but not as much as it does in, in our neck of the woods. If we were to look at the same information, though, not on an isoline map, but on a choropleth map, what you can see here is that it keeps the shape of the state intact. So what I mean by that is when we, when we were in an isoline map, it just drew that line clear across states, didn't really pay attention to borders or anything. In this map, the borders are, are kept. So the state is actually filled up with a color that represents a different level of corn production. And those colors are demonstrated in our map key over here, in the legend or the key, how, uh, however you want to reference that. Um, so the different colors, if it's gray, little or no production, yellow, below 10 million. If it's that dark green, we're talking about over 2 billion bushels. So Indiana, if I asked you, okay, how many bushels did Indiana produce in this year? You would look at this and, and say, okay, I, I can recognize that green color as matching up with this green color. And you would tell me between 100 million and 999 million, 999,999 bushels. So um, that's uh, uh, how we would use a choropleth map. That's probably the most common one you're going to see. Here's a dot distribution map. Each dot represents 100,000 bushels of corn produced. So, like I said, in both Illinois and Iowa, and much of Indiana, our neck of the woods here, up in northern Indiana, um, you can see it's, it's like a blob because there are so many dots that it almost fills up the entire state. In other states, though, let's look at Montana. Montana's this big one up here that borders Canada. 
you can actually see the individual dots. In Illinois and Iowa, you can't see the individual dots because it, there's too many of them, right? You can't make them out. But in, con uh, not countries, but states that are only growing a little bit of corn, you can actually see the individual dots. So that is a dot distribution map. A graduated symbol map, in this case, is taking a circle and based on the size of that circle and which state that circle is placed on, it's a different level of corn production. The biggest circle is 2 billion. The next one down, which you can also see they've color coded it for us, is 1 billion, 500 million, and 100 million. So Indiana has this uh, second largest circle there, and that would be around 1 billion. And then finally, my favorite type of map is a cartogram map. And we've basically taken the, the country and the states and change the sizes entirely based on corn production, only based on corn production. So if the country looked like this, based on how much corn you produce, Indiana would be a very large state. Uh, Illinois and Iowa would be the largest states in the, in the entire country. Montana, on the other hand, which is a huge state, would be really, really small. California would be really small. Texas is very small when, when Texas, as we know, is a, a, a huge state. So um, that's a cartogram map. It's specifically designed to, to represent a statistic based on the size of the area. So that leads into your assignment, and your assignment can be found in Buzz. It's called the Types of Maps Challenge. And what you're going to do is find your own example of each of the five different types of maps. So you're going to use the, uh, either the same topic for each map, such as corn production, or you can use a variety of topics. It's up to you. You'll be given a Google Slide template. So we already created a template for you to use that has the map types listed. I'm going to show you that in a second. Find a good example of each one, paste it on the appropriate slide, give it a title, such as Coropleth map corn production, just a simple title on that slide, answer all the questions, and then submit it. So that's it, you guys. Uh, all we're asking for today is that you complete that Types of Maps challenge. Um, find five different maps on Google. Uh, you can just use Google Images or whatever image search engine you'd like to use. If you're a Bing person, use Bing. But uh, what I would do, let's say you're looking for something like uh, population. Okay, Just type in the search engine cartogram map population or choropleth map population use those key search terms uh, in, a, in a wise way, right? Um, don't make that searching too, too difficult for yourself. Use those actual terms in the search and it'll narrow it down right away. There are millions of these maps out there, okay? You gotta remember that this has been around for a while. These maps have been around for a while. These terms, this study has been around for a long time. There's lots of great information out there and you can find any types of maps you want. Just keep it appropriate and uh, Answer the questions that go with them, submit it when you're done, and that's it. Thanks, guys. See you next time.